All right, hello, I'm Marina Vertebrook Zoology. My name is Kevin Kosa, and I am an assistant professor at the University of Alabama. In my lab, we study the biodiversity, systematics, and evolution and genomics, a little bit of everything to do with mollusks. The particular one of the groups we work on is the kind of strange worm-like apocophorin mollusks, which I'm gonna tell you a little bit about today. So apocophorins are unusual um, compared to other mollusks, are these strange worm-shaped animals that completely lack a shell, but instead they're covered with calcareous structures called sclerites. So these are in the form of like spines or scales that cover their body like a coat of armor instead of a single protective shell. So if you look at some of the animals in this plate here of photos, you can see like in A, the tail end of this animal looks really shiny because those calcareous sclerites, which are like flat and scales, are reflecting the light from the camera taking a photo of it. There's two major groups of apocophorin mollusks. There's the caudophobiates shown in A through C here. And so these are kind of like honorary worms. These are mollusks that have completely secondarily lost their foot and they burrow in marine habitats where they feed on things like foraminiferins and nematodes. There's about 130 described species, so 130 species or so that have a name, but we know of many more what we can call like known unknowns, species that are sort of known to science, but no one's gotten a chance to formally name them yet. And the other group is Salmonogastries. So these are D through H here. So these animals do have a foot, and so we could say that they're epibenthic, they're living on top of sediment, crawling around. Sometimes we find these wrapped around things like corals or hydroids, which is their primary food, most eaten by darians. And there's about 350 species in this group, but again, we know of many more known unknowns. And there are certainly many more species out there waiting to be discovered. And so the point I want to make about this group is like many groups of invertebrates, it's a really understudied group. There's just a handful of people in the world who actively work on them. And whenever an expert goes to a new place, we find new species. So there's a lot of work to be done to really understand the true diversity of this group. Just some photos to show you a little more of their diversity. These are some selenogasters. So this is a giant species from Australia. This one's up to 20 centimeters in size, which is some of the biggest in the world. Um, so on this top right, you see this kind of mid-ventral line, which is the foot that they crawl around on. Here's one from Antarctica that's in a dish of seawater. You can see it crawling, in this case, on the surface tension of the water. And so it's got this kind of pink mid-ventral foot, and it's sort of like a slug. But again, if you look on either side, it's got some schmutz stuck to it. But you see these sclerites reflecting um, some of the light from the camera flash. These are more typical sized animals. Most apocophorins are pretty small. They tend to be uh, found in the deep sea and polar habitats, and hence why they're not a really well-known group to most even invertebrate zoologists. So this is a typical size one that's you know, maybe a millimeter or two. Uh, most are pretty small. Some from the tropics can be really colorful. They're not all kind of boring colors. Um, this is one of many really colorful tropical ones, but they're often very small. You don't have a good sense of scale here, but this animal is maybe a centimeter long at most. So most are pretty small. Aplicophorins um, often look really similar um, if you're just kind of looking at them under a light microscope. But if we get them under a scanning electron microscope, the shape and pattern of the sclerites is really different from group to group. And so by looking at the SCM, we can see um, pretty big differences among different taxa. So some have scales, some have even hooks, others have um, only one type of scale. In this case, this one has scales and spines. And so this can help us identify them to different major groups. Um, and so why am I so interested in this group? Well, apocophorins along with chitons or polyplocophorins form the sister group to all other mollusks. And so I'm really interested in mollusks because within this one phylum, we have everything from like the colossal squid, some of the biggest invertebrates, to these microscopic worms that live between grains of sand. And so it's kind of interesting to me to think about what was the last common ancestor of this incredibly diverse phylum like? And so we can't just consider the, the most economically important and most heavily studied mollusks, things like gastropods and bivalves. We also need to consider these worm-like apocophorins and chitons. And so, um, Unfortunately, there's not so many people who are actively working on this group. And in fact, in the last 10 or so years, we've lost kind of the world experts on this group. And in particular, I'll mention Ami Scheltzma and Ludfried von Slaveni Plavin, who uh, describe like a third of the species in this group who have been named so far. And so we need kind of a, a next generation of invertebrate zoologists who are studying some of these understudied groups of animals to um, help keep that expertise going. So when we find new species, we can formally name them and um, understand, for example, if they are of conservation concern. Um, one of the reasons there aren't so many people working on this group is, like a lot of invertebrates, their study can be a bit of a challenging um, endeavor. So this animal here in A is a new species that I described from um, right off the dock at the University of Washington's Friday Harbor Marine Lab. And I've seen animals that look kind of indistinguishable from this from 
Friday Harbor, Norway, Iceland, Antarctica, off North Carolina. There's a lot of little kind of nondescript spiny worms that tend to be dirty, even under the SCM. I can't really tell these things apart. And so we also have to do histology. So we embed them in plastic, we cut them with a diamond knife, look at their internal anatomy, and then we can tell some of their um, species apart based on internal anatomy. And in particular, their reproductive anatomy, some of the glands that they're anterior end for feeding, et cetera, are really characteristic and help us identify different species. But it takes a lot of work and a bit of training to be able to interpret these histological sections. And so there's a steep learning curve with this group. Um, so one thing we're trying to do to make this a little bit easier is instead of doing um, histology, which we actually have to physically cut the specimens, is to do microcomputed tomography or micro CT. And so this is a newer technology where we can x-ray specimens from multiple different angles and then um, do virtual histology or look inside of them with these x-ray images and create 3D reconstructions without ever damaging the specimen at all. And so when we're done, we can just put it back on the shelf in the museum but still have internal anatomical data. And so currently in the lab, we're trying to use a so-called integrative taxonomic workflow where we combine traditional tools like microscopy with cutting edge tools like microcomputed tomography. We're also using um, scanning electron microscopy to look at that exterior structure as well as DNA extraction and barcoding to sequence mitochondrial genes. And then we can make a microscope slide voucher from what's left after the DNA extraction, which is those sclerites that don't dissolve. So we have a permanent voucher that goes in the museum.